In dictatorships and communist countries, the regime manipulates the media to distort public opinion and brainwash the people. Propaganda is a powerful weapon in authoritarian countries that can achieve the goals of the regime and defend it from opposition. Is that right, Tony? Yes, that's right, Gina. When Russia invaded Ukraine, Russia persistently insisted that it was a military operation, not a war. Russia was calling the Ukrainian government Nazis, similar to Goebbels' operation, and a tactic that aroused the anger and hatred among the Russian people. This Russian propaganda is very similar to what Goebbels carried out in the past. We should not be subjected to propaganda or brainwashing and have the ability to recognize which mass media or political organization is doing what kind of propaganda and for what purpose. Goebbels is a criminal from history who made Hitler the Führer and manipulated the media to drive the German people into World War II where he and others sacrificed countless German, Jews, and other Western and Eastern Europeans. The demonic agitator Joseph Goebbels, propaganda minister in Nazi Germany who became the subject of journalism and research in the 20th century, changed the history of the world. The generation of Joseph Goebbels who was born in 1897 and thought the most turbulent period of the 20th century. World War I broke out when Goebbels was 17 years old. The Great Depression broke out when he was 32 years old. And the World War II broke out when he was 32 years old. Goebbels had a club foot bent like a golf club around the age of four and spent a rough period of growth. He resolved his complex about physical disability by studying. Goebbels, a young man who showed talent for studies, even received a doctorate in literature in 1921. Unfortunately, reality was difficult. The reality of Germany in the 1920s was nothing but hell. When Germany was defeated in World War I, the Empire Goebbels grew up in collapsed and the country was now called the Weimar Republic. In a country where the emperor had disappeared, power continued to be dispersed and elected leaders changed frequently. This process led Goebbels to naturally become skeptical of democracy, saying that democracy was not suitable for the German people now. In addition, murderous hyperinflation struck in the aftermath of the enormous war reparations, which Germany could not afford at $33 billion. In two years, prices soared 1 billion times, so the value of money fell by the hour. Unemployed people poured into the streets. The situation in German society at that time was really messed up. Goebbels must have thought that Germany was a desperate country with no hope at all, and that really revolutionary drastic measures had to be taken. Is that right, Tony? Yes, that's right, Bella. Goebbels experienced continuous job failure and his country was considered hopeless and his anger was directed at the state, capitalism, and the Jews. 
it was believed by people like Goebbels that the financial capitalists and the Jews manipulating them from above blocked their path. In difficult times, it is common to dream of becoming a hero. A hero also appeared to Goebbels who was tired of unemployment. In 1923, when Hitler, who caused the Munich Beer Hall riot, gave an inspired speech in court, Goebbels decided to risk his fate on this leader. Goebbels joined the Nazi party in North Germany in February 1925. At the time, the party was a mixture of far-right and far-left ideologies. Goebbels was only part of a leftist faction in the party then. It can be said that the faithful meeting between the two men was on April 8, 1926, the day Hitler invited Goebbels to Munich. Goebbels gave a two-hour speech in a beer hall and Hitler liked Goebbels very much. That event is how Goebbels started playing in the big league. Goebbels followed Hitler's approach and the conservatives and eventually threw off his own socialist ideology. Goebbels' full-fledged agitation strategy was first displayed in Berlin. At the time, Berlin was the core base of the Bolshevik Communist Party, and the Nazis were a rookie that was literally unknown to people. Goebbels staged a large-scale protest by mobilizing the brown shirts or Nazi stormtroopers. As he provoked the Communist Party with inflammatory slogans, bloodshed erupted as expected. This bait got to the Nazis into the media spotlight and known to the public. Goebbels and his stormtroopers appealed to the crowd by waving the flags of Haken Cruz. Newspapers covered the event with great excitement and the Nazis became famous overnight. Goebbels tried to stand out in the public eye by any means necessary. He said he would concourse the streets, concourse the masses, and he would concourse the masses, concourse the state. At the time, it was an important point that dominated emotion, not reason. Goebbels' agitation strategy can be summarized in three ways. Propaganda indoctrinates iteratively. Furthermore, it expands public negative emotions. The Great Depression of 1929 was a great opportunity for the Nazis. By 1932, 35% of all workers were unemployed. Germany's unemployment has reached 6 million. Goebbels used the confusion of the masses, the despair, the fear very effectively. The point of propaganda was to make an enemy. Goebbels' enemies were Jews and Communists. Goebbels made Jews a scapegoat to achieve his and Hitler's goals, which later became the beginning of a terrible historical tragedy. Is that right, Gina? Yes, that's right, Cindy. In order to unite all classes into one, a public enemy was needed, and the Jews were perfect for that. The workers hated the Jewish capitalists who controlled the economy, and the right wing feared the Jewish revolutionaries. 
At that time, there were many prominent Jewish people in commerce, religion, and professional jobs. Goebbels raised the public's feelings by repeatedly emphasizing their deep-seated feelings, saying that Jews exploit and live off other people. By the way, this kind of anti-Semitism and racism was very suitable for internal integration, but in fact, it was condemned by other Western countries. Another thing, the enemy of Western countries, communism, was also defined as an enemy. Goebbels emphasized that Germany was blocking the spread of communism in Eastern Europe. Hi, Bella. Goebbels had his heart set on making Hitler president, but it's not an easy task, is it right, Bella? Yes, that's right, Gina. In 1932, Goebbels was determined to make Hitler president. However, the competition was so strong that it didn't seem like it would actually be a contest. Hindenburg was the chief of staff who led World War I, and Hitler was a corporal in the reserve. Goebbels, however, presented a splendid case for Hitler. He created the image of a savior flying around, maximized Hitler's appearance with magnificent drumming and military marches, and eagerly screened Hitler's films in the middle of a big city. In this election, Hitler was defeated decisively, and eventually Hindenburg was elected. But Hitler was able to establish himself as a politician with national recognition. Is that right, Tony? Yes, that's right, Bella. In January 1933, Hitler was appointed Chancellor, and two months later, Goebbels was appointed Minister of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. This position was when Goebbels was 36 years old. It opened a great career path for a job seeker who had been dissatisfied with the world just 10 years ago. All the press fell right into Goebbels' hands, and he made the propaganda systematic. Goebbels placed particular importance on radio, the cutting-edge new media of the time. He said it was important to spread a form of radio to indoctrinate people in every corner of the country, regardless of whether they were rich or poor. The radio that came out was called the National Receiver, and it cost 76 marks, but the government subsidized it and lowered the price to 35 marks. The National Receiver was the cheapest radio in Europe, reaching more than 70% of German households, the world's highest distribution rate. Later, this radio would also be called Goebbels' mouth. The entire nation had to listen to the ideology of the Nazi party and the achievements of Hitler every day through this radio. The public could not listen to foreign broadcasts through national receivers. And Goebbels actively utilized the TV which was not familiar to everyone, on top of the newly born radio. The Berlin Olympics were broadcast live on TV for the first time in the world. Goebbels even controlled the film industry and managed its actors. He knew how powerful the effect could be when propaganda thoroughly seeped into the entertainment enjoyed by the people. A referendum held across Germany in 1934 changed history. It was a vote to give Hitler all the powers of president and chancellor. 
the result was overwhelming a problem, and Hitler finally rose to the position of Führer with absolute power, backed by the support of the people. This moment was when Goebbels' dream for his life finally came true. Hitler's madness was heading towards World War II, and Goebbels was paving his way with an incredible propaganda campaign. The United States was aware that propaganda played a huge role in winning or losing the war, and after witnessing the absolute obedience and madness of the German army in World War II, and began to analyze and study Nazi propaganda after the war, Goebbels tried to justify the aggression and convince the public, and said that anger and hatred are the most powerful forces that excite the public. When Germany was about to annex the Sudeten region of Czechoslovakia, it infuriated the German public by repeatedly provocative reporting on the mistreatment of German residents there. At that time, the first propaganda unit of the German Wehrmacht was established. The propaganda unit made a documentary and moved to each region and repeatedly aired it in a mobile theater. Until the attack on the Polish capital in September 1939, the German people had not heard the word war. Even when Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, it did not express that it was a war. Nazi media described it as a counterattack. Goebbels, who controlled domestic broadcasting, threatened that anyone who listened to or disseminated foreign broadcasts would be sentenced to prison. The context is the same as Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which it says is not a war, but a military operation, and the suppression of anti-war media in Russian broadcasting stations. In this way, dictatorships use the media to distort public opinion and brainwash the people. In authoritarian countries, propaganda is a powerful weapon to achieve the regime's goals and defend the dictator. Brainwashing and propaganda, which are commonly used by communist and dictatorial countries these days, have been practiced for a long time, and a famous historical case is Germany's Goebbels. Goebbels, who had been on such a winning streak, eventually committed suicide due to Germany's defeat. Goebbels was Nazi Germany's propaganda minister and led a policy of extermination of the Jews. Goebbels committed suicide in Berlin on April 30, 1945, by drinking poison, along with his wife Magda and his children. His body was discovered by Soviet troops, who cremated it. The method of propaganda, instigation, and brainwashing the public is the same today as during World War II. We need to be able to recognize which mass media companies or political groups are putting out propaganda and for what purpose. Therefore, we must develop the ability to discern so as not to be subjected to propaganda or indoctrination. Thank you for watching the video, Propaganda Minister Goebbels in Nazi Germany, provided by History and Current Events. Gina, Cindy, Bella, and Tony have contributed so far as narrators. Thank you.